I'm not sure if Mike Gundy is just sales pitching to be a politician, but even Ray Charles can see and Stevie doesn't have to wonder what the problems are in Stillwater America. At this point in time, we might as well bring Biden out of hiding to run this offensive dog and pony show. You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by to make this your first listen. We're available on all of your podcasting platforms, visually as well on YouTube. Find me personally on X at All Day State. Today, we're partially brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment matter more. Right now, with FanDuel, you can place a $5 bet and get started with $200 back in bonus bets. Guaranteed. Make sure you visit FanDuel.com to get started today. Meanwhile, we're going to shift into the conversation of our fearless leader, the man, the myth, the returning mullet, Mike Gundy. And although I don't want this to be a a long diatribe about how unhappy we all are collectively, I tried to watch the most recent Mike Gundy interview, and I made it exactly six minutes and 37 seconds before I couldn't take any more of it. Because what, what is the sales pitch, sir? Like, who who are you sales pitching and what are you trying to gain by this pitch by trying to tell everybody that Alan Bowman only really had like five really bad plays and the rest of the game that we'd have thought he played pretty well? No, we have eyeballs. We watch the game. People don't have to be a savant to know what the defense is in coverage-wise to understand that a quarterback has deficiencies when he keeps throwing off of his back foot when there's nobody within eight yards of him. That's the difficulty. And then to say that it was better than Utah, okay, sure. So Utah looked like a bunch of monkeys humping a doorknob. So you're saying Kansas State, because he threw up for 350 yards, it was less like him looking like he was humping a doorknob? Maybe. But that doesn't fix the issue. So why are we getting this sales pitch as to why we should not believe our eyes, nor should we believe in the statistical metrics that say that Alan Bowman is barely a 60% quarterback. Why should our eyes deceive us, right? With all due respect, it's not like Mike Gundy has a proven track record of picking the right quarterback. You can go back historically and see that this is a little bit of an issue. So as much as I want to hoot and holler about how Casey Dunn does not how to call an offense, I don't think that he does. I think most of us would agree with that. The bigger difficulty now seems to be, what if what if we're falling into a Spencer Sanders style of situation in 2022 when maybe the situation is a little bit different, but you have a portion of the locker room that is starting to not believe in the in the dog and pony show that is being presented. And when your head football coach is saying that we don't need to change anything offensively, we're good to go. And Alan Bowman's been handling this very well. Again, handling it well compared to what? Because on the field, he's not handling it very well. Production wise, he's not handling it very well. Fixing his fundamental off base platform. It's not going very well. So what is going very well? How is Alan Bowman handling the situation to a degree that Mike Gundy is comfortable and happy? We have gone from the cardiac cardiac Cowboys to possibly the complacency Cowboys to what now? The consolation Cowboys? My gun is sitting there talking about how, you know, we're playing really bad, we're playing really bad, we're playing really bad, and you look up and you're only down by three or seven or whatever. So that's what we're what's what we're here for. We're here to be in games, but not necessarily to win them. Like, this sounds absolutely ridiculous coming out of my mouth. Imagine how more ridiculous it sounded coming into my ear holes from my Gundy. Like, what is this painting a picture that everything's fine, that we're good to go? Utah and Kansas State are quality losses. That's not the issue. Everyone in Oklahoma State country, if you just said before the season started that we were going to lose to Utah and Kansas State but went out for, for everything else, okay, we'd we'd have been down for that. And we'd have understood them two losses. But instead we lose to Utah, and we looked completely inept throughout the course of it, offensively at least. And then we fast forward to Kansas State, and because he put out some yards, we're going to ignore the fact that he missed so many throws that were wide open. 
then he made so many horrendous decisions when we did have wide receivers that were breaking open. The fact that he seems to be a, a fearful leader instead of a fearless leader. It is starting to look like this is why Mike Gundy decided to bet on the Alan Bowman horse. But is it just me or does it feel like we have something brewing here? Whether it's between Casey Dunn and Mike Gundy? I don't know. But it, it almost feels like this is a Mike Gundy decision that no matter what anybody says, this is what we're going to be stuck with. And instead of just acknowledging the fact that he's been playing horrendous football or the fact that our offense has been called horrendously, you're going to sales pitch everybody on how we don't really understand things and our eyes don't really tell the whole story because if you really think back of it, he only had what, five or six bad plays. The rest of them were pretty good. Like, wh who are you sales pitching? If you're sales pitching Alan Bowman, like to, to make him feel warm and cozy, okay, that's that's something. It's one thing. Don't know that it's a good thing. It just feels like there is a an internal peeing contest right now between Mike Gunny and Casey Dunn. And it almost feels like Casey Dunn's actually the one that's ready to kind of turn things over and start a new chapter offensively. And it almost feels like Mike Gunny's the one saying, no, don't you do anything. You better keep Alan Bowman as the dude, and you better stick with the status quo because if we're going to ride this thing into the dirt, we're going to ride it into the dirt with Alan Bowman. Is it just me? Or does it appear as though Mike Gundy's kind of written off whatever happens the rest of the season happens? Like, if Alan Bowman's not the dude and – we don't think Garrett Rangel's the guy, well, then at least let us see it. Give Ran Garrett Rangel a game with the week of install with the first team, and guess what? If he's absolutely horrendous, then we move on. And Zane, yeah, he may be banged up a little bit right now, but he's not going to be banged up forever. And after West Virginia, we have a bye week. So if you start Garrett Rangel and it's an absolute disaster, then you have time to potentially get somebody healthy. This whole train wreck of a season, it doesn't feel like we should be just cashing it in. But if we are going to cash it in, then why are we sticking with the seventh-year quarterback that clearly has more deficiencies than he does abilities? Just like monetarily, if we keep this up, we're going to have deficiencies in the hammer of the over department. And I'm sorry. Here on the Hammer of the Over Club, last year, the Hammer and the Over kind of worked out well for us. This year, it's not really looking so hot right now. But it's okay because NFL season is here. You've been seeing Chuba Hubbard get out there and do the daggone thing, just like you've been seeing Justice Hill as well. This is the return that you've been waiting for from America's number one sports book. When you get that sensation in the middle of the game that Chuba is about to bust out for a big one or Justice Hill is about to haul in another touchdown, you can check out the latest stats, live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you're going to view your bets from. You can get started with $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed today when you place your first $5 bet. When you place your first $5 bet, get that $200 back in bonus bets by going to FanDuel.com. Again, that is FanDuel.com. Make sure that you go there today to get squared away in the monetary department because there's still time, right? We may have a little faith in hammering the over. We may have lost faith in Alan Bowman last week. But according to Mike Gundy, we should feel better. Well, as I just somewhat alluded to, Garrett Rangel has had some opportunities thus far at Oklahoma State, and it hasn't gone swimmingly. I also think that there's a negative connotation attached to Garrett because of the limitations that he has shown in games. And I'm not saying that Garrett Rangel is the answer, but I think we can all see that Alan Bowman is not the answer. And if Zane Flores does have a minor injury and he's only 90-ish percent, then, okay, maybe 
we see what Garrett can do with a week in preparation with the first team. Because it is different coming in the game after, you know, getting split second team reps. It is different getting in there after not getting any first team reps for a few weeks. And then to not necessarily be a part of the install and some of the conversations with the wide receivers and what they want to do with the option routes if the safety is doing X, Y, or Z. It is difficult to kind of get thrown into the fire. Now, I think that we can all agree, and I would assume Garrett would agree as well, that when he does get in the game, he's got to perform better than he did the last time he went out. But he could also probably benefit from knowing all of the plays instead of getting thrust into the game and maybe not getting the same plays that he would have if the second team were in the game. Maybe the route concepts that he has and the familiarity with Tal and Shetron looks so good because, oh, I don't know, they rep it together, they work it together, and they understand from a, a spacing perspective where each other is going to be and what windows they need to try to exploit. So once again, the sample size for Garrett Rangel has been adequate, I, I think is fair, and thus far his play has been inadequate. That also is fair. But this disillusionment from Mike Gundy telling us that Alan Bowman's doing well and he's handling it well and he's player playing better than Utah and this and that and the other, like the only reason Alan Bowman played bad is because we had to throw the ball 50 times. Okay, well, Ollie Gordon's in the game. He finally gets a couple big runs. We finally get to see a little bit of the old glints back into Ollie Gordon. He's averaging 5.1 yards per carry and he only sees the ball 14 more times the entirety of the game. Like th that's a done problem. But if you're not refusing, or if you are refusing to fix the Casey Dunn issue, and now somebody is refusing to fix the Allen Bowman issue, it does kind of feel like we're just letting the season float by. And I, I don't know, maybe apologize for my animosity because we're, we're witnessing what is likely the most physically gifted team get absolutely wasted. We're watching the gifts of NIL and the contributions and the QR code and everybody with folks with a purpose and all the fan base and the donors all kind of rallying together to bring back this epic roster that was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime run for Cowboy Country. We're not getting our money's worth. If you go to the games, like if you were at the Utah game, you can attest to this. That might have been the hottest first half I've ever seen, experienced, been to ever in my life. It was torture and then the on-field performance was even more torturous and then imagine being a defensive guy playing for this squad and you, you put forth a valiant effort and you only give up a touchdown and then you have multiple stops but your offense never scores and then you're putting that you're playing 60 70 85 snaps in a game and then you have to do it again the next week it was a little bit different with 2021 because we schematically had some abilities, but we're also starting to see now the part of 2021 and portions of 2022 that were still somewhat serviceable were because of the Herculean effort defensively and Spencer Sanders. I mean, we can all agree that maybe Spencer didn't leave the greatest of ways, but I think we can also agree that Spencer dealt with some things in the locker room that were unfortunate. And it caused a little bit of division. And he still found a way to kind of work within the limitations that we did have offensively by putting the Superman cape on and, and taking us, digging us out of bad situations. Alan Bowman cannot put on a Superman cape and dig us out of situations. We've been able to see that for a long time now. Alan Bowman was supposed to be a bridge quarterback. He was supposed to be the bridge last year to whatever the bridge was going to be this year, whether it was going to be Garrett Rangel or it was going to be Zane Flores. We didn't know. Having him back, that was comforting. Having that senior leadership along the offensive line and the, the tutelage for the other quarterbacks to learn from Alan Bowman, all encouraging. But I don't think anyone assumed that if Alan Bowman was absolutely horrendous, that we would just be stuck with dealing with it. And if the coaches really don't believe in Garrett Rangel that, that much, then, like, what was the sales pitch to bring him back? What was the point? Like, if nobody ever believed in Garrett Rangel then this entire time, which obviously some people did because there was a concerted effort to make sure he came back. But for what?
right? And and can we say that the development or lack of development from Alan Bowman and Garrett Rangel is problematic? And if that's the case, how come the head man hasn't adjusted it? Not only that, but how come we're giving raises and we're giving contract extensions? Again, I understand that battling back through adversity last season was phenomenal. And I understand that Mike Gundy diving in the way that he did was one of the biggest reasons why we were able to make that turnaround. But it seems that Mike Gundy has a reluctancy this year to apply the same pressure as last year. Maybe we're just that bad off. Or maybe our head coach just doesn't develop or doesn't read quarterbacks the same way. I don't know. Because him saying that Alan Bowman only had like five or six bad plays and the rest of it was was really good, it tells me he didn't watch anything or I don't know anything about football. Like I must be absolutely clueless watching film because I didn't see just five bad plays. Like you see more than just five bad plays in the first quarter. Like what are we talking about, Gundy? Who are you sales pitching and why? Why are you trying to convince everybody that our eyeballs are stupid and Alan Bowman actually played pretty good? I don't, I don't understand what we're doing. Not just on the field, but per- perception, right? And the perception was building positively for Oklahoma State in the offseason, in recruiting. But what's it doing now? See, my, my, my frustration isn't necessarily even with Mike Gundy in this moment, nor is it with Casey Dunn in this moment. My frustration is with the the lack of urgency by Mike Gundy or Casey Dunn, seemingly, to do anything about it. Like you just saw Purdue fire their coordinator, not even midseason because he's underperforming. Now, we know that's not going to happen here. Because unfortunately, we do have a lot of evidentiary proof that Gundy's just going to hang with it to hang with it. And that's okay. I mean, it's not okay. But if that's the status quo that we know we have to deal with, we're okay with dealing with it. But we would like to see what the future is going to be. Like, if, if we're giving up on a CFP and a Big 12 title, right? then we need to see what the future is going to look like. And I understand when when Zane may not be 100% ready to go right, right now, but I assume he will be after the bye week. So hand the keys over now because we know what this thing looks like with Bowman. Give Garrett a full week with the starters, with the install, with the game plan, with the route tree, the concepts, the option routes. And if it's a disaster, then in the bye week, we, we plan on moving forward with seeing what, what the Zane Flores show is going to look like. Alan Bowman was going to be the guy to lead us to the CFP promised land. Okay, so if he's not the guy, we need to see what else we have. And if Garrett's not it, then we need to begin the Zane train. Because if we're looking at a 7-5 and five style of season anyways, then we might as well see what we have to look forward to it's the same to some degree defensively. Yeah, we haven't looked great. But people tend to forget that regular conversations still happen. So as much as there's going to be a, a lot of camaraderie on the team, there is also normal conversations that happen in the dorm rooms about the roster. Like the players have these conversations. They all talk about, who should be the quarterback or who should be the middle linebacker or who should be like, they get it. Like they understand when there's a freshman that's better than everybody. Most of the dudes are talking about that freshman outside of the stadium. Now there are times where there's a very close race and people don't know, but even then players realize that if I don't catch a break, I'm not helping myself get to the pros. If I'm playing 85 snaps a game, 80 snaps a game, 70 snaps a game defensively, and we never get to catch a break, I'm not helping myself stay healthy. I'm not helping myself get to the league. I'm not helping my teammates out either. So then you kind of have to rotate. 
And then sometimes in the rotation, there's miscommunications and things happen in the back end. And I mean, the defensive line has to get pressure. If they don't get pressure, the guys in the back end are, are screwed. The wide receiver and the quarterback are always going to have the advantage in a scramble drill. That'll never change. So th the DBs are going to be um, with their backs against the wall more often than not. And we're, we're not helping Nardo. I mean, he's, he's not helping himself sometimes too, but goodness me. Whether you're looking to get into a Cowboy football game or you're just looking to check out a concert, local comedy scene near you, Game Time Tickets is the best in the industry for a reason. Game Time has a new feature called the Game Time Picks that makes it easier for you to buy your favorite tickets and get them for events much, much easier now. The Game Time Picks makes it much easier for you to get things that aren't just sports related. Again comedy, theater, concerts, whatever it is, they have you covered. The seat view is panoramic, so you know precisely what you're getting into before you show up to the stadium. The game time ticket coverage gives you the best covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the industry. Make sure that you get the best in the land with game time tickets. Take the guesswork out of you buying tickets with game time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. But again, create that account, redeem that code Locked On College L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today because you already know what time it is. It is Game Time. From uh, Game Time to cross-country time not the dave smith cross-country team although maybe they need to help brian nardo in this defense because we are the returning ncaa national champions in cross-country and we just started the season off hot breaking records at the local jamboree so we could be looking at another national championship in the sport of cross-country so why not take the cross-country dudes and put them on the football team because to play defense at Oklahoma State right now, you have to be better at running stadiums than making plays. Because our dudes are on the field so much, they're not even really getting to showcase their talents because they're dog-tired the entire time. You want your three deep to be tested, but it's getting to a point where the defense is getting abused to a uh, um, an unrecognizable level by the end of the season if this stays the way that it is like watching nick martin go out at the end of the game and you know knowing that he's not exactly ready to rock and roll right now either does it not just add more anger to the mike gunny interviews or the alan bowman interviews or a casey dunn conversation like hearing everybody talk about how everything's okay and Bowman's really playing good and the game plan's not bad. and It makes me feel for the defense. Because again, these are just normal dudes at some point in time. They have normal conversations. And publicly, they have to acknowledge the fact that it's a team effort. And as a team, they're just not you know collectively getting it done. But there is animosity. It's natural. Like you watch NFL films, right? And, and you hear some of the Ray Lewis stories. And this is knowledge that comes out later. But there are times where the players just call it like it is. The players on the team know who should really be the quarterback. The players on the team know that what we're doing def uh, offensively is just screwing the defense. And so eventually it does become frustrating. Right, You have hope, you have faith in your dudes. But when you're playing on defense as a player and you know that the problem is between the head coach and the offensive coach and they're not going to resolve the problem because they're like two school kids having a peeing contest, you're going to get left out on the island. And I do feel for Brian Nardo because, yeah, again, hasn't looked great more often than not. 
But when he does string together good performances, he doesn't get help. When the defense does put together multiple stops and multiple three and outs, they get no help. So naturally, as a human, eventually that's going to wear on you. Eventually it's going to get to the point that it's kind of hard to focus on team-oriented goals. Like at one point in time, this is a business. Mike Gundy has said they're pretty much employees now. So at what point in time do your employees start looking at the business model and saying, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I can make enough here to feed my family. I don't know if my paycheck's going to be adequate enough to keep doing what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm going to keep working overtime hours when nobody else is willing to work those overtime hours. If you're a player and you're putting in all the extra work and you're putting in all the extra time and you know that maybe the coaches are the ones letting you down, eventually it's going to wear on you. These dudes are obviously willing to go to war for Brian Nardo and Brian Nardo is willing to stay up the extra nights and, and deal with the sleepless times to get this defense as prepared as possible. But even he's got to know that I – I'm not going to get the benefits of the good things when statistically it looks like my defense is terrible. Statistically, it looks like we can't stop nobody. But if you watch the games, you see that's not exactly the case. More often than not, Brian Nardo's defense gets stops, turnovers, or they get, you know, uh, three and outs to give the offense the ball, followed by the offense having the ball for like, 55 seconds. And then we know what we have, at least creativity-wise, in the special teams, but we don't seem to be doing anything out of the ordinary. So Brian Nardo deserves some heat. But he doesn't deserve as much as he's getting, nor does his defenders deserve to be playing that amount of stat- snaps and having that amount of wear and tear put on their body for an offense that's not even trying to correct anything. Like, again, it would be one thing if the defense could see, you know what, guys, we just got to keep doing our thing. They're trying to figure something out, right? We got to hold up our end while they figure it out. That's one thing. It's another thing if you're a defender that's saying, guys, we got to keep doing the daggone thing, even though we know that they're just – they're not going to help. It becomes demoralizing. And once the demoralizing starts to become fracturing, then you have locker room issues. Everything is still salvageable right now. But I can say that without even, you don't have to know anything to know that as a player, you're watching the leadership. And if your head coach is trying to sales pitch everybody that we're all blind and dumb. Alan Bowman's playing pretty good football, and we just don't know anything. The players understand that 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 their head man is selling a bill of goods to everybody too. This is now a business, and so unfortunately, when things like this transpire, the natural question is, which one of these players is going to make a business decision first? I mean, and you already saw it from Jason Queso Brooks. And I don't know, you just common sense, man. If you're a redshirt freshman, true freshman, or a returning you know, junior that doesn't necessarily get to play a whole lot, but you came back for a Big 12 title run, a CFP playoff run to, to do something in Stillwater that hasn't really been done before. If you came back for all of that, and this is what you're getting, and then you're seeing that there's a disconnect between your head coach and your offensive coordinator, and there's a disconnect between your offensive linemen and the quarterbacks. Again, doesn't take rocket science to see that there's problems and there's infighting happening somewhere, and the people getting screwed are the defensive players that are busting their butts. And I'm not saying the offensive guys aren't. It's just, Whatever the bust in the butts on the offensive side looks like, it's not productive unless you're a wide receiver. Anybody who. That's all we're going to have for this one right here. As always, you know I love you. God bless. Go Pokes. Thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen here on Lockdown Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere. 
So happy you choose to be here. Like it if you like the daggone thing. Dislike it if you don't. That's okay, too. More importantly, share, comment, and subscribe. My podcast people out there, you're the bricks, the butter, the bread, the fondue. You know what it is. Hit the stars, leave a review, do what you do. All right, y'all. Later, my taters.